good afternoon and good evening my dear brothers and sisters welcome to another session of q and a question and answers and today we are continuing with the bearing of arms and whether how appropriate it is so these are the questions we were discussing in the past in past few uh, couple of programs and we continue with that because we need to understand that the basis of our church is uh, depends or our our principles are oriented based on this major question so we need to understand this question very well so we are privileged to have sister Raquel Oste once again thank you. sister welcome thank to the you. program and uh, before we begin today's program let's ask God's help let's pray Our most loving, gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Father, for this moment that you have given us. Lord, bless us with thy wisdom, knowledge, and thy spirit. Be with Sister Raquel in a special way, Father, as she is helping us to find answers to many of our questions. Be with all our viewers who are listening, who are following, who are watching. Lord, help all of us to understand this subject well, so that, Father, we can be faithful until the end. All these mercies and pardon for our sins we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As usual, sister, I would like to ask you, are you ready to answer the questions? And uh, the the viewers, uh, they asked me uh, one question that is... Uh, why we are discussing in detail about this uh, mm -hmm. uh, subject because of course we are getting questions from very uh, a limited crowd who are really interested in this uh, question uh, question and they are waiting for the answers and they want clarification but generally the others may not know the impact or the subject Maybe hereafter they, they are learning this subject. I think that will uh, make a change. So can you just uh, give a brief why, yes. briefing why we are studying this or why we are discussing this subject? Yes, I think uh, everybody knows about the war in Ukraine. It's already 70 days since the invasion that they suffered through Russia in this sovereign country. Uh, so the war began a very realistic event at this moment. We see always in the news, comments all over. But beside that, that this became a very uh, present issue, is that one of the fundamentation and the reasons why we exist as a church is exactly to preserve and to follow these original truths of pacifism. And therefore, it's so important to understand our religious identity, the background that we have that justify not only our existence, but also our purpose and our message. Okay, thank you, sister. Thank you for explaining that. And uh, we are having the questions now. And we are coming down, we are advancing towards uh, the present time. Uh, from the history, I think we are in the period of reformation. We stopped mm -hmm. there last time. Yes. And now we are progressing towards that. And now we understand that, you know, the uh, according to the book of Revelation, as we, we learn, as well as the history, we understand that, you know, the, the Europeans now beginning to migrate to America. Exactly. So we actually, we stopped yeah, last time. Yes, we, we already came to this point that uh, reformation took place, that a clear um, separation between uh, Catholicism and Protestantism took place, even if this happened in different branches with different uh, theological orientation. Mm -hmm. But the main common element was Bible based, only Bible, solo Biblia. So that is very significant, this concept in Latin language, 
to understand that now it's not what the Pope decided, not what the Council's uh, resolution was, but only what the Bible says. Okay, but uh, I have a question here that this pacifism was not practiced by all the reformers of Lutheran yes. reformers. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Um, and, and that is a very important question because yes. people say, okay, good, we speak about the introduction with the Cathars and Waldenses, the Husitan, um, about this new tendency of pacifism. But mm -hmm. when the Reformation triumphed, especially in Central Europe and Northern um, West territories in the continental Europe, uh, we find here a disfragmentation. So we have reformers that use war to take retaliation or vengeance against Catholicism. So we have countries that are completely divided between Catholics and Protestants. And this provoke the majority of the wars in the European continent from the 17th to the 18th century. So that is very significant. Now, among these reformers, we have conservative and radical Orthodox reformers that say, okay, we cannot participate in war. We, we, we don't organize crusades. We don't kill people. That, that is not our call. That, that is not the purpose of our existence as a church. So then it's also a split, it's like a schism inside of Protestantism between the Orthodox literal understanding of the Mount of Blessing and the ones that took a more liberal, accessible and political approach to religion. Okay, so now I have, this is my question to you because yeah. uh, I want a clarification on that uh, the definition you gave. Now, we, uh, if we consider Holland yes. or the, the, the Dutch, mm -hmm. when they participated in colonization and something similar, similar to uh, in a crusades, they were also promoting the Dutch reform church. Yes, yeah. Dutch reform church. Yeah. So, why they were doing that? Because were they not following the reformation or? Yeah, he, here is the thing. You know, Europe was in a special circumstances when Reformation took place. Since 1525, we don't have the countries established and sovereign as we know today. For example, one of the reasons why the Netherlands, together with Belgium, become independent of the Spanish crown mm -hmm. is, again, the position toward Catholicism of Protestantism. Another issue is the King of Spain is at the same time the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire at the same time. Okay, so the majority of the population of Germany and the princes and dukes took position toward Protestantism, but the Emperor is a Catholic one. Okay, so during the 16th, 17th century until the beginning of the 18th century, we have all the time political, religious issues connected with Protestants and Catholic countries. Uh, beside that, um, obviously, have political and economical uh, uh, reasons for this conflict, but together with that, population to clear separation with other territories and countries in Europe based on religious issues. So in the moment that religion became part of the politic and was connected with the state, as was during the Middle Ages together with the papacy, then we follow exactly the same pattern. The groups that decided, okay, no, we cannot uh, compromise our faith with the state. Uh, we have a very clear example for, uh, with Swingley and the, the Reformation in, the Switzerland, in Switzerland, okay? So a, a schism with Swingley that he went to war 
against Catholics very strongly. We have the Anabaptists. They were together with Swingley. One of the elements was rejection of children baptism. That is the reason why they are called Anabaptists, because this means baptized again as adults. But the other element is war. Okay, we cannot defend, we, we, we cannot preach the gospel by uh, force. by force or with weapons. Yes. So the other element was the war in England between the Catholic Scotland and the Protestant Anglican Church in the south part of the island. So here is a similar issue. The problem is power, but if you find uh, ethical or moral justification of the war, and that is, okay, they don't follow the right truth. So they are Catholics, uh, we are Protestants, so we are in the right, so again, we can go to war. So people from there also migrated to the Netherlands, and, and they are in contact with um, the Anabaptists in, in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So, and these people feel the pressure of their own reformers to participate in war. And, and, and we have a double crisis in reform at oh, this time. Okay, so I, I know that you have the PowerPoint. Yes. I think we can learn more with yes. the PowerPoint. Yeah. I think let's go to the PowerPoint now. Yes. And then we can, I can present the questions for sure. the questions to you. Okay, let us uh, connect it with our previous um, uh, presentation and we, we are covenant in this one America United States from the colonial period to the Adventist organization and and this is extremely important for the um, fundamentation of our belief today so we mentioned the Anabaptists around 1524 1530 um, how they clearly reject participation in warfare direct or indirect war. We have also mentioned uh, the creed of the Church of Anabaptists in the three points that you can see here, especially connected with absolutely pacifism. Now, here is the thing. Um, the Anabaptists, uh, as I have mentioned in the introduction, is even mentioned in the great uh, controversy. We find it Memo Simons, from there is coming the name Mennonites that were um, derivation from the Anabaptists that at the same time was a derivation of the Swingley Reformation and they believe was not participation in war and this become one of the convictional pillars for these radical Christians. Now, these descendants from Memo Simons become the Mennonites and they were, the Mennonites were persecuted in Switzerland, Germany, and Holland. And in this country, they come together. And we will see here clearly something very significant in this family tree of denominations. We have the first big schism in 1054 when from the Catholic Church is created the Orthodox Church. Then we have, by 1534, the Anglican Church, or the Episcopal, or the Anglican Church. And, and then, at the same time, if you go to the bottom of this family tree of denominations, you find here, 1525, the Mennonites, uh, from there also, um, by um, 1603, the Amish, all the line of the Anabaptists. By 1536, we have the evangelic, Evangelical Free Church, the Lutheran Church in general. We have the Presbyterian following the Calvinist line. And then from Calvinism and the basic Lutheran and Anabaptists, we have the Congregationalist and the Baptist. And from the line of the Anglican Church, the Episcopal, we have the Methodist. So all these main uh, variations of Protestantism, we will find in the early founders of Adventism. And that is very significant for us because we will come back to that. So 
the early generations uh, were considered um, by year 1682. In year 1682, um, the uh, British crown, the English crown, um, give a charter to establish the colony of Pennsylvania in order to get rid of all these radicals. Okay? So, um, was created the Religious Society of Friends. And in fact, that was the first pacifist colony established in North America during the British government when they granted this charter. So, the Friends or the Religious Society of Friends had emerged already in Britain in the mid of 1650s under the leadership of George Fox and by this um, leader is, is a, a clear uh, position toward pacifism in a literal understanding again from the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon of the Mount. So with the establishment of the colony of Pennsylvania in 1682 we have the first pacifist colony in the United States. It's not United States now as only British colony, okay? Now, here is the thing. Between 1682 and 1756, uh, since the start of the colony in Pennsylvania, um, happened a conflict between the desire to expand uh, the colonial enterprises in North America, especially uh, by eliminating or uh, relocating the Native Americans to other places or even taking their territory. And this provoked tensions in the colony. So the Quakers specifically and the Friends, uh, Religious Society of Friends, relinquished their leadership role in the colony in 1756 because that was a contradiction between the immigrants that came, the regulation that to acquire more country, more territory, this required also warfare and violence toward the natives. So in order to avoid these circumstances, they relinquish the leadership of this colony. Now, when we are dealing with these difficulties in the United States, um, not yet an independent country, by early 18th century, a new movement um, arise in Germany, deeply influenced by Anabaptists, and again, they were persecuted because they didn't follow the concept of conflict between Catholics and Protestants. So they established pacifist groups in Pennsylvania help uh, the Church of the Brethren, that was the name, they included the Brethren, like the Mennonites and the Quakers, and they helped them to move to Pennsylvania. And by supporting them and helping them, they include the open commitment to pacifism together. Mm -hmm. So by the, eight, the early 18th century, we have at least uh, well referred three groups uh, under the concept historic peace churches uh, that moved to the west and south from Pennsylvania and established communities also in nearby new colonies. So that was a very significant element here. So this pacifism movement moved because of the persecution in, in Europe and the pressure, social and religious oppression toward the United States as we have described in the prophecy and revelation. Now, that the, the pacifism tendency was so strong that even the founding fathers of the United States, like James Madison, that um, elaborated the early draft of the Bill of Rights following the revolution, include a provision uh, established the constitutional right for conscience objection in the face of war. Uh, finally, that was not granted, but the influence of these historic peace churches was very, very significant. 
Uh, excuse me, I have a question here, sister. Now, you, are, you mentioned about James Madison. Yes. And uh, the, the person who is responsible for, I could say, drafting the... Civil uh, rights. Uh, yeah, civil rights and everything. Bill of Rights. Now, uh, this person, was he affiliated or connected with any of these groups or not? Also, not officially, not that we have a reference, but um, he respected uh -huh. uh, the concept of pacifism, um, freedom of speech, and part of it is the, the concept of free of religion. Freedom of religion was one of the main elements that established the Bill of Rights and after the Constitution. So considering that was an important representation of people that rejected any violence or warfare, uh, Jane Madison put that on the table. Unfortunately, this um, draft of leg legislation didn't pass, but we will see that we'll consider after. So the, the foundation of when, when began the uh, Revolutionary War or the Independence War, th that was a, a background concept already during the past uh, period of colonial um, representation of these historic peace churches. Yeah, so I think uh, it's yeah. clear now we can uh, go with the... Yeah, let us the... continue and, mm -hmm. and that is very significant for us too um, to consider uh, our main element and it's the 19th century. So it's the first peace societies and the moment of total war. Um, we know that the Revolutionary War was a militia, so the, all of them were volunteers in some way or another. So that was not our official drafting to be part of the Revolutionary War. Now, we find here that when the United States become a sovereign country, uh, these peace, peace churches or peace societies um, again, ex spread the explicit convic conviction about rejection of warfare. And that was part uh, of the opposition to war, and this became also an element to discuss in a state policy. But we have another issue here in this emerging uh, free country, and is the anti-slavery movement. So we have the peace society generally connected with the anti-slavery movement, movement. I have a question here. Yes. That is, you know, we were, to we were talking about uh, the group of Protestants moving to America. Yes. Now, the question is that what we heard in the history is that they always had encounters with the Native Americans. Yes. And uh, and even some people talk about genocides. And so yes. On. Yeah. So so now you are talking about pacifism mm -hmm. among yes. the reformers, yeah. and it is contradicting the historical note. So yeah. what is your explanation on that? Okay, uh, we need to understand that we have two main colonies that were founded with a charter mm -hmm. at the beginning, uh, and that is Jamestown and East Plymouth. Okay. So Jamestown was a business charter, okay? They needed to find gold, they needed to, to um, find richness, commodities, and um, become wealthy. That, that is the purpose of the charter in Jamestown. And we know that tobacco was the main element by this time, and they make extremely successful, uh, at least for the first 50 to 60 years, at the production of tobacco in Jamestown. Now, we have the Puritans or the separatists that are having a charter, and, but we know that by a storm, they were deviated for the main target that was to come to Jamestown. Uh, now, they finally stop by Plymouth. Now, these are not the same people. Okay. This is not the same people, and we need to understand that Okay, so we have Protestants in Europe 
And we have Protestants in the United States that some are in favor of the war and some are against the war. So the Protestants against the war were the Quakers, the Anabaptists, um, the Mennonites, and the Amish. Okay. okay. All the rest, they were in favor of war. For example, mm -hmm. uh, the Puritans that arrived to Plymouth, they believe that is like conquering Canaan. Mm -hmm. So for them is the promised land. So this land belongs to them by divine um, donation. So these native people, you don't even care to give them the gospel because they are pagans, they, they are barbarians, they are savages. So we, they don't know how to work the land, they don't use the resources, they are savages, okay? So we don't care about these people. So we take the land, they don't accept it, okay, they need to go. So then we find all the process of uh, that characterize American history is the manifest destiny. Mm -hmm. So they believe, okay, this country, this land is given to us by God. And our purpose is to evangelize, not the ones that are here because they are savages. So the ones that are coming and the one that is staying. Mm -hmm. So we need to get the land and we need to extend from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Okay. That is the manifest destiny. Uh -huh. So, and the natives, they need to move out. So therefore they were uh, relocated, they were establishing reservations, um, a general genocide was perpetrated against these uh, native people, that is a fact, uh, but that is not this group of Protestants. Okay, so we need to understand it's a diversification at this moment. They are in different territories, are not in the same state, and they have uh, different goals why they are settling down. Okay, okay. okay. So th that, that is, we cannot put all of them under the same contents and say, okay, all the Protestants were pacifists that arrived to the colonies and all of them were high spiritual people. No. Uh, some have a literal understanding of the Old Testament and they say, okay, this new land is our Canaan. So we conquer, we possess the land and we dominated the land. By force. Yes, if it's necessary. If the people don't give it to us, we will take it. Okay. According to all possible measures. Because they will tell you, okay, Joshua lit the army of Israel. And we already mentioned this aspect of the Old Testament. But the, the point is, they were a nation, they, they have a territory and they have an army. So they took literally understanding. They believe this is the Canaan. This is their territory. So for them, it's a divine justification to be there. Oh, that is the reason. So Absolutely, the yes. Both parties are arguing, presenting yes. arguments of their own. Yes, that is correct. As usual. Okay. Yes, now, unfortunately. We can, we can go further. Sister, yes. What is uh, happening now? It is going to be now, very interesting yeah. after this period. We are coming to the 19th century and um, again it's very clear the peace churches stay in open rejection of warfare um, and now we are coming to the American Civil War. Okay, okay. and here um, is the first time that this happened. Okay, so it's relatively recently they become independent and now um, we are in a civil war. Um, we know that this began by the moment that Abraham Lincoln was elected as president of the Union. Um, the issue between the North States and the South States was a conflict moving since the last 75 years, almost since the independence. Okay. So you see all the time the tension between the South States and the North States. And the issue is very uh, easy to understand. It's an economical issue, okay? Mm -hmm. So 
the most industrial develop and more um, established infrastructure by the first um, industrial revolution, we have it in the North State. Okay. Now, in the South States, we have plantation systems. So they are agriculture states based on cotton. Even all the South States were called the Cotton Kingdom. Okay? okay. So they have the land, they have a commodity mm -hmm. that, in fact, they cover 85% of the full production of cotton of the, of the world at that time. Okay? So you don't have a high uh, elaborated infrastructure, it's not needed, mm -hmm. and the labor force is completely different from the one in the north. Why? Because you have a labor force in the north where the majority of the population live according to wages. That is not the case in the south. In the south they have slaves. Okay? So here is a clear differentiation. The majority of the population is concentrated in the north. Mm -hmm. In the south you have less infrastructure, you have less industry, but you have the majority of the money. Okay? okay? So here is the thing that established attention because in the House of Representatives is based on citizens. The Senate okay. is based on the state. Yes. representation. So here is a problem mm -hmm. of uh, power of representation oh. because if you are not majority representation of a state because of the population in the south they created even that the slave will have representative by the white people in order to achieve the same level okay that is American history but it's a problem since the beginning because it's a disbalance in the process of representation. But the point is that in the Senate is where you finalize a law. Mm -hmm. So if you have the majority in the Senate, you control the decisions well, at the end because they will not pass. Okay, yes. they move okay. from the House of Representatives but will go not further. So the tension and to achieve that more states become slave states versus the states that have not the majority of slaves was a conflict of political representation. Now, that is to understand that all the states in the Union was a slave union. Okay, if you are a slave in the South and your owner take you to the North, you are still a a slave. Okay. okay, so we need to understand that slavery was an official institution, not represented in equal proportion in the states of the north or in the south. But that was very significant. So from this moment on, we have a clear separation. Was the power of representation will be not equal in the South feel that they will be discriminated in the political power representation that we they will have. And that's it. Okay, I have a question here to you. Yes. Coming closer to this subject, was the Adventist Church, early Adventist Church, mm -hmm. supported slavery or not? Uh, that, that is very important because we have here a crisis uh, mm -hmm. Among also the pacifist originally groups like the Quakers, the Amish, the Mennonites, and even by the early Adventists, because here is the thing, okay, uh, is, is the Adventism began in the North States, okay, it's yes. not a South State origin, was extended after, but was not there at the beginning. So the anti slavery movement was very present by the first Adventist movement, okay? Oh. But therefore the crisis was even more complicated because, okay, by the traditional pacifist is no war under no circumstances. Mm -hmm. But now here theoretically is again the concept of the Middle Ages of a just war. Yeah. Because if the purpose is that colored people become free, 
okay, theoretically, that is a good thing. So we find that it's a crisis, generally, at this moment in theological conceptual understanding of the Protestants that since the beginning they were pacifist, pacifist okay? So the Quakers stay firm in the position. The Quakers were extremely um, mm, defenders of anti-slavery movement. Okay. And, and in fact, they invested, they help, they assist, uh, they do everything possible. Now, by the other movements, we see here a debilitation of the concept based on a slavery issue. And, and that is what brought to the early Adventists um, a confusion at the beginning. For example, we read the article of the nation written by James White, and there he say, and he defend the war because is to free the slaves. Yeah, actually that's a good question because, because uh, the, I, I have that question here yeah. to ask you because they, uh, the, this is another question that you know the common Adventists are mm -hmm. talking that James White always supported the uh, war. So what's, yeah. what's wrong with that? Yes, uh, it was not the only one. For example, Wagoner Father, he okay. wrote clearly, okay, that is a just war, we need to do it because it's for a good purpose, mm -hmm. whatever. So by the founding fathers of Adventism was also a crisis, okay? We don't practice um, violence or we don't involve in military things, but this is special circumstances, you know? So with the vision of Sister White clearly that stated we cannot be part of this war, okay? Then was finalized the issue and was clarified also this article, The Nation. James White write a clarification. Sister White also commented about the probably misunderstanding of this article. And that is very important that we consider the after clarification of this article. So finally, that was neutralized completely, this position. And James White write clearly against the war. So you need to put the first, the second, and the third all together in context to understand that they were confused at the beginning. They were a diversity of opinion, but when the word of God clearly established a vision and decision was taken, they stick to that. Okay, so that is a good... Uh, yes, it's, it's very, uh, very significant. Uh, it's a situation yes. and I think yeah. the viewer, viewers who are having this question that uh, I think they got the answer with the, with the PowerPoint. I think we can proceed with the PowerPoint. Sure. So yeah. I think I have some more other, other questions also. While progressing, we can ask. Okay, sure. So we are now by the American Civil War. So yes. from April 12, 1861 through April 9, 1865, we can have three different periods related with the position of Adventism towards civil war. Mm -hmm. And something that makes a difference with all the rest of pacifistic movements, Mennonites, Quakers, or Anabaptists, is the Sabbath. Because all of them, okay, defend anti-militarism, but they don't consider the fourth commandment of part of this, because the majority of them also don't observe the Sabbath. Okay, we will see the Adventism not only put um, the innovation in the concept of pacifism based on anti-war, mm -hmm. but also emphasize uh, the commandments. In, in clear difference with all the former pacifistic movements in the United States. So therefore, the Adventism established a clear differentiation at this moment in comparison with all the other historical pacifistic movements. So let us see these three main phases that are extremely significant and we need to understand clearly. Yeah. So the first period is from April 12, 1861 to March 3, 1863. So the first period is characterized by approximately these two years that was a voluntary enlistment. Okay, okay. that is not drafting here. Okay, so 
all the army was based on volunteers. And at this moment, it's not an issue uh, because, um, okay, they, they are not obliged, they are, it's not compulsory. And it's when we have all this uh, conversation, it's when the polemic came up, what to do, what not to do, how far is that justified, how that is good or not good. And then we have a lot of writings uh, about this period. Then we have, we go to the second period, that is March 3, 1863 to February 24, 1864. And in, that is the first time in the history of United States that a draft is coming in place. Okay. It's the first time. For the people who are not yes. it's going to the war. You need to be drafted. Okay. okay, now. But with two options. Mm -hmm. One is substitution, and the other one is payment. What do you mean by substitution? Okay, so they were two options, okay? For example, if you are drafted and you name come in the list that you need to go as a soldier, yeah. you have two options. If you don't want to go, you need to provide another person, an individual, physical person, that say, okay, I will go in the place of this other one. Mm -hmm. Then was, okay, and you are free because somebody is taking your place. Okay. That was allowed. That was allowed based on different reasons. For example, if that was um, the only son of a family and, and the risk exists, okay, if the father is at war, in the war, and the son is in war, and both die, so this family is, is, is disrupted, okay, the land, the inheritance, everything. So if you provide somebody that say, okay, I will go in your place, that can be a cousin, a friend, a neighbor, whatever, will be accepted and you will be free. And you cannot be drafted again, okay? So that is by substitution. The second option is, no substitution, is payment. Okay, the government require a payment. Mm -hmm. And the payment was $300. $300 was the salary of a completely year for a common worker. So, very difficult to acquire this money and to pay it cash in front of the authority. And, okay, that we are the two options. If you don't provide a substitute or you don't pay the $300, you need to go to work. That's it. It's no other option. Okay. That was so, final. Okay, they very firm on that. Yes, that's okay. it. So, during this time, the Adventists help each other to obtain the money required for the exemption. Mm -hmm. Okay? They make um, gathering of uh, money, donations, a monthly payment to gather to a common fund, and we have a lot of information in the review on Herald announcing how much money they have gathered, uh, which churches have done the, given the most. So they choose to give to the Caesar what the Caesar require. So they never ever uh, deal with substitution. They never brought somebody else to go to war in a state myself. Okay, what they pay was what the government require, not to go to war. So that was the option. Now, the third period, and the fact is the last period of the war, and we find some amendments to this originally uh, drafting regulation. And then from February 24 to July 4, 1864, is the first time that appeared the concept in a, uh, a, in a legal paper from the government, the conscientious objection. Mm -hmm. So, and that was very, very important. So, you need to fulfill several, several issues. So, you need to have an organized institution registered by the government in your specific state. You need to provide this registration. You need to provide your certification of member, active member in good standing of this institution. And then, okay, you will be free not to be drafted, but mm -hmm. still you need, to do, you need to do things. 
For oh. example, there were three options. Okay. First option is still to pay the 300. A second option was to work in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And the third option is to assist and care in the um, refugee camps of the free men of the South. Okay, okay they were three options. And it's very interesting here, it's very, very significant that the Adventists don't choose to serve in the hospitals, don't choose to assist in the refugee camps of the freemen of the South, they continue pay, paying the $300. Okay. And that is very significant because, okay, before was no another option. Now they have this indirect collaboration in the world. They reject it completely. Okay. Now, you came to the question that I exactly have here. Yeah. You said that we are not collaborating with the war yes. and here the money. They yeah, because the money is not given to the war. The, the payment is given to the government. The question I have is that, okay, wasn't that participating in the war also with money? For example, today we pay taxes. Yes. Okay? So the government administrated this money mm -hmm. and the majority of the money is dedicated for weapons, uh, for defense of the country, for border protection, for law enforcement. And, and we disagree with these actions mm -hmm. as religious people. But we are not responsible what the government do with this money. For example, in the case of Jesus, when the question was presented, what about the payment to the temple, okay? Mm -hmm. And w was asking to Peter, and Peter, okay, he, he precipitated himself to answer, because according to the Old Testament, prophets and priests, they were exempt of payment, and, and Jesus was both. So <laughs> he was exempt, but okay, Jesus uh, protect his disciple in this case and say, okay, give to Caesar what is to Caesar and to the temple what is to the temple, okay? So that is very significant. So if you pay the taxes to the Roman Empire, they use that to pay the soldiers and at the end they will crucify Jesus Christ. Yes. So with other words, you can say, okay, Jesus give the money so that they incarcerated him and finally they brought him to the cross. So we are not responsible for the money, how the government manage the money. God will judge them accordingly. So we don't collaborate in war by the fact that we pay the taxes, for example. And we know that a, a high percentage of this amount will be used for uh, defense and, and military actions worldwide. So this will be my answer. Um, to this question. Okay, they don't decide about that. The option was you don't want to work, okay, you pay 300. This is like um, a, a tribute that the government require because you deny this service. But $300 is uh, nothing much maybe for this time period like now, but at that time... Was very significant, was very one year good. wages. One year wages. Yes, it's very, very significant. And it's very interesting because the church organized themselves in such an effective way that they were able to pay, to pay for the pastors, to pay for everyone that was drafted. Oh, okay. Yes, so. that is very significant. And we have the confirmation also in different documents that we are going to see now in the yes. next slides. Yes, we can go further. Thank you. So... Um, let us continue. Based on these three phases, um, we have the first declaration of uh, Sister White related to this uh, element uh, of um, intervention in war. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, pages 361 to 362. Here is only one part of this quotation. I was shown that God's people, who are his peculiar treasure, cannot engage in this perplexing war for it opposed to every principle of their faith. In the army, they cannot obey the truth and at the same time obey the requirements of the officers. There would be a continual violation of conscience. So that, 
with this statement that was absolutely uh, neutralized confusion or interpretation or personal opinions or at the beginning, right, the by this first phase that was not compulsory. And it's very interesting to note that this uh, quotation is from Testimonies to Churches, Volume 1. Mm -hmm. so exactly. It's exactly the, it's the period. The time. Right, yes. yes. Let us go to the second period when this... Um, um, the Enrollment Act of 1863 was issued. So during the Civil War, the United States Congress passes a conscription act that produced the first wartime draft of U.S. citizens in American history. The act called for registration for all males between the age of 20 and 45, including aliens with the intention of becoming citizens. Oh. Yeah. So by April 1st, so exceptions from the draft could be bought for 300 or by finding a substitute draftee. So this we already mentioned. So um, this uh, decision produced several riots, especially in New York, uh, because people say, okay, only the rich one can pay that. So this meaning the war go when all the poor people what is that? that? That is not fair. It's not just. That was really difficult at this time. And it's very significant that this exception was given and Adventists choose this uh, position. Okay. Uh, I have a question for that. Like, uh, this is for better understanding or clarification of yes. the situation. Now, we understand majority of the Adventists were in the northern part of United all States. of them, yeah. All of them, but uh, did they have any members in the south at that time? Uh, not at that time. Not at that not time. Not that we know by no. And uh, the second question I have is on that line. That is, uh, did the south also had an option to pay this three hundred? No, in the south was not this kind of regulation. When we speak about that, uh, they were already no part of the union. The south. They were completely emancipated from the south, oh, okay. from the north. So therefore we have the Confederate Army is the South States, and then we have the Union Army. And these were the faithful to the central government. And and okay. that is very significant. Okay. Okay, that's nice. So it's a, it, it's very well, it's a very good clarification we understand here how the how the seven day advent or oh, sorry not uh, yeah by that time they were keeping the sabbath oh yeah yes absolutely and they were seven day adventists and how yes. they were they, they were opposing uh, yes. legally or you know with the decision that no war yes um, let us go to the third phase and partially we have already mentioned mm -hmm. And that is in, in July 1864 um, was um, the possibility also, as what mentioned is at the second drafting, uh, because the idea was the war will not so long uh, extend it in time. They believe that will be an easy thing. They realize it's not the case. So now, uh, even if existed already, the no combatants is a sign act of the con Congress in February 24, say, duty in the hospitals or to the care of the freedmen or shall pay the sum of 300. Uh, and as we have mentioned, they choose the 300. And, and it's very, very interesting because they, they never consider uh, to participate not in the camps of the freemen or in the hospital for that. Now, by August the 2nd, 1864, we have the statement of principles presented by the Executive Committee of the Seven-day Adventist General Conference that was presented in, from, in front of the governor of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And here is the elements that make a difference with all the former pacifism. Say, taking the Bible as the rule of faith and practice are unanimous in the views that its teaching are contrary to the spirit and practice of war, 
Hence, they have ever been conceptually opposed to bearing arms. Theoretically, until here, is the historical line of pacifism. Now, we go to this, the other section, say the fourth, speak about the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and then the fourth of these commandments requires cessation from labor on the seventh day of the week. The sixth prohibits the taking of life, neither of which, in our view, could be observed while during military duty. And then the last section say, we have been content to pay and assist each other in paying the 300 commutation money. Okay. okay. So this make a clear difference with the Seventh-day Adventists and all the former pacifist uh, denominations before. Because the central point is not only pacifism, but is based in the law of God. And based in the fourth, <clears throat> excuse me, and in the Sixth Commandment. That was never argumentation presented for any other uh, religious institution before. Um, it's very interesting that with, uh, with this declaration of loyalty, they respect the government and they appeal in this way. Now, the governor of Michigan answered uh, practically a couple of days after and say, I am satisfied that the foregoing statement of principles and practice of the Seventh-day Adventists is correct and that they are entitled to all the immunities secured by law to those who are consciously opposed to bearing arms or engaging in war. And we know which are these three, okay? And we will read it again. By, and that is very significant, by September the 1st, 1864, the Provost Marshal, General Theo McCartry, give the following response. So we have here from the governor and we have here from the marshal and say members of religious denominations who have been drawn in the draft and who establish the fact before the board of enrollment that they are consensually opposed to the bearing of arms and are prohibited from so doing by the rules and articles of faith and that their deportment has been uniformly consistent with their profession will be assigned to duty in hospitals or to care of free men, or shall be exempt on payment of 300 to such person as the Secretary of War may designate it. And that is very interesting here, because in the Review and Herald from January 24, 1865, because of the time, I will not read all, but only this section, uh, James White Wright, it is said that the next draft will take about one in three of able-bodied men livable to the draft, and it's supposed that this proportion of Seventh-day Adventists will be drawn. That is one in three. Consider that the membership of the Seventh-day Adventists at that time was between 2,500 to 3,500 people, okay? okay? Um, so uh, was significant, but not uh, dominant at, at okay. this moment. And we see here in the Review and Herald, that is clearly saying, in this case, each should pay into the treasury $100. The same will be sufficient to pay $300 for all drawn in the coming draft. So it's very interesting that we don't have any reference that, for example, if Adventists that apply for the uh, uh, exception, that they say, OK, then you go to the hospital. No was not the case. They don't assign them to any of these other two options yes. because they immediately pay the 300 and that was completely resolved the issue. Okay, now uh, I have the question to you. Yes. Did anyone, uh, because I'm, the question is that, okay, or were all the members faithful or did anyone go to war? No, 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 I'm going to war. Yeah, that, that is very, very important to understand, but because we will see that, yes, even the position of the church was clear, legalized, and confirmed by the government, mm -hmm. they were still members that enrolled voluntarily uh -huh. into the war. And it's very important to know what the church did at that time. So I have here only two cases I uh, will be added here. 
uh, and that is very important for us. So it's the, they were this fellowship, this fellowship, oh, all okay. that become combatants. And we have the names, at least from these two, it's Hiram and Bates. It's, it's no connection with Hiram or with uh, Joseph Bates, okay? Joseph Bates, that okay. Is, is not connected with them. But for example, we have here part of the minutes of the church meeting say, the Church of Plum River in Green Valley, Illinois, met on the second day of January in business capacity, and after due deliberation, we draw the fellowship from Hiram and Bates, who was voluntarily enlisted in the U.S. service, thereby showing that he was not in harmony with the views of the Seventh-day Adventists. And this happened January 24, 1865. So they are still at war. And he was this fellowship because voluntary enlisted. We have a second place. And that is interesting because this second one is in the Church of Battle Creek. Okay. It's Enoch Hayes. As voluntary enlistment into the service of war is contrary to the principles of faith and practice of Seventh-day Adventists as contained in the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, they cannot retain those within the communion who so enlist. And O'Hayes was therefore excluded from the membership of the Battle Creek Church by a unanimous vote of the church, March 4, 1865. And that is very, very significant because the concept of um, freedom of conscience means, okay, you go to war, Okay, that, that is your decision. We tolerate that. You don't go, okay, you are also free not to go. Now, that was not the case by the clear position of the original seven Adventists. They say, no. If you go, you cannot be member anymore because you don't represent the faith, the, the belief that we have as a church, so you cannot be part of the church. So this kind of hybrid relationship that, okay, you accept part or you have um, ethical, circumstantial understanding because it's more favorable for me or whatever, this option didn't exist. We see here the unanimous, this decision was taken. Yeah, it's really even, interesting to see that. And even the reason was given because this don't correspond to our faith. How he can be member of a church that he don't represent, so he cannot be more in our fellowship. Okay, I think uh, this gives the way for us to understand, better understand, maybe in our next program, when we are going to deal with the world war situation yes. mm -hmm. and the current uh, situation, yes. how we, we, we should be dealing and how our position in the church and also what happened with the world war, I think this yes. is giving a clear understanding and these two cases, I, I, this is the first time I'm seeing this uh, statement. Okay. of uh, these two, uh, you know, the minutes of uh, these two incidents, I think it's very clear the early pioneers, they have, yeah. they have stood by the principles. Yes, Praise absolutely, the yes. The they were not exceptions. Yes. Yeah. No compromise, no dilly we get very straight with that. And yes. it was a unanimous decision. Right. So... Thank you very much for presenting. You are this, very welcome. Uh, Thank you. Program. It's, it's my pleasure. Day. I think it is a big blessing for many of our viewers. And viewers, please send us uh, more questions to us so that we may be able to accommodate your questions. And we are going with the questions that we were generally be, we were being asked during our symposiums. And uh, we always take note of all these uh, questions. So this, we have just developed the questions from your comments and your questions but if you have any specific questions on specific incidents or anything please send it to us so i i heard from uh, different parts of the world that many of you are having the clarifications of many of your questions so thank you very much for encouraging us and writing to us and please keep sending your questions so thank you once again to all of you for joining us and before we conclude today's program i like to invite you sister please lead us in prayer thank you
Our Father in heaven, we come to you with grateful hearts for the wonderful truth that you have given to us and entrusted us uh, with these wonderful experiences from the past that show us the loyalty to your word, the firm position toward the truth. Help us to continue to hold the banner of pacifism and anti-militarism in all circumstances as your original desire was and as a vital attribute of the remnant church of the end time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we thank you once again and uh, thank you for joining us and until we see you on another Q&A program next week, God bless you, God be with you.